It's so good to see all of you here this morning. Isn't it a beautiful fall morning? I woke up this morning and as many of you just looked out the window, and there's a little bit of frost out there, so it's a reminder to us that uh, we're definitely in fall, but what a gorgeous caribou morning out there. And so glad, I'm so glad to see each one of you here um, today in church this morning, in our church meeting. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer before we open his word. God, we thank you. We thank you for the provision that you provided for us, that you give us everything that we need. Lord, you've seen us from the beginning of time, and you've called each one of us here today. Lord, we open our hearts to you this day. We ask, Lord, by your spirit that you would speak to us concerning matters of your word, God, and, and the truth that is so filled and packed on every page. Lord, prepare our hearts this morning for communion at the end of our, of, of our passage this morning. And God, we, we look to you for our sufficiency and for our strength. And thank you, Father, for these people. Thank you for the Apostle Paul and, and what he's written to the Thessalonians. And God, as we continue this journey, um, just, just open it up to us, Lord. I pray that hearts would be changed. And for those that are listening online this morning, God, pray that you would meet them where they're at. God, you know every need. And for some that are at home, God, they are lonely, and maybe they aren't able to make it out to, to a service. I pray that you would comfort them, especially this morning, and wrap your arm around them, Lord, and, and that they would know that they are loved. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So today we find ourselves at the chapter 3 in 1 Thessalonians, and uh, my message this morning is about the heartbeat uh, of the gospel. And um, when we look at this particular chapter, um, as we're going to be going through it verse by verse, um, we see something that's just burned into the pages. It's, it's just so evident the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, he wrote this letter with genuine love, genuine love and concern. You know, some people pay lip, lip service and say, oh, I love you, you know, but it, it's not necessarily genuine. But Paul, in this letter, shares the genuineness of his affection for um, the believers in Thessalonica. Um, but you see, when he wrote this letter, he, was in, uh, he and his team were in Athens, Greece, which is a fair distance from them, and, and he pondered the circumstances that they were living in at the time, and it was, it was apparent, it's apparent here that these people were in his thoughts and in his prayers. And when he says the church, we're talking the people. So sometimes we get this wrong idea about church, and we've said this before, where the church is looked at as some sort of institution or, uh, uh, you know, this distant thing that we kind of come into and come out of. But Paul's letter is to people. People like you. People like me. People that are loved by God. And when Paul had to leave Thessalonica under circumstances of persecution, he, he hadn't had enough time with the people that he desired to have. And he was forced to leave, so it pained him to leave these believers so soon after the, the church had been established and, and to be separated from them. And if you can imagine yourselves in a world before technology where there wasn't you couldn't just pick up a phone. And for that matter, you couldn't just text them or there was no internet or anything like that. There was no communication. And they were separated by this distance without communication. And, and Paul, when he came to that church, he was so concerned for their well-being. And when he left under circumstances of persecution, you can understand that he also knew that he had been persecuted the other followers of Jesus in that same town would be persecuted the same way. So he knew 
that they would be going through difficulties. And he prayed for them. He thought about them. And he also understood that they probably would be wondering how he was doing, knowing that he had to flee with Silas and the rest of his team from that persecution. And, and they probably understood that Paul and, and his ministry team were continuing to face persecution where they were at in Athens. And, and that was true. And Paul had entrusted the Thessalonian church to God. Paul was a man that had come to understand Jesus Christ in a very personal way. He had a deep faith. He was, he was called to be an ambassador for this gospel message that had gone to the Thessalonians. But in the midst of all of that, sometimes we forget something. When we look at these words, we look at Paul and we go, wow, how lofty and how amazing was his life. You know, like, oh, if only, if only I was even a smidgen like that. Well, you know what? I want you to know this. Paul the Apostle was a human being. He was a human being like you and like me. The Apostle Paul had feelings. He had thoughts. He had aspirations. And sometimes, yes, he had fears. And those things needed to be consistently handed over to the Lord and given to the Lord. Now, Paul, we see in this chapter, had entrusted the Thessalonian church to God. And, and that faith that he had drove him to concern about them. But being human, Paul struggled with feelings towards these Thessalonians. And, and, it, and it's apparent that he had a difficult time resting in the Lord and trusting the Lord um, to take care of them. Why? Why? Because he was human. And humans sometimes have a difficulty trusting in the Lord. So he writes to them about his thoughts, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. So he's thinking about these people. He's up at night praying for them, but can so concerned. So he says this. He says, so when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who was our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and to encourage you in your faith. So that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way as you well know. For this reason, I could stand it no longer. I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. And you see him. Paul loved these people. He loved the church. He recognized that this particular church and all churches, in fact, were embroiled in not just a physical battle for their safeties, but the root behind that was a spiritual battle that was going on. In chapter 2, we see leading up to this, this is an unfortunate division. As you know, the scriptures weren't written with chapters and verses. Those were added later. This is a letter. And it's unfortunate that the division took place where it is between chapter 2 and 3 because right before this, and it flows right into it, Paul recognized that there was an enemy out there that was trying to keep things from going well. In chapter 2, he stated that Satan had actually successfully blocked him and keep, kept him from returning to the Thessalonians. Did God allow this? Absolutely, he did. Is God sovereign over all? Absolutely, he is. And sometimes, God allows us to suffer. Sometimes, God allows us to be tested and tried. Life is not a cakewalk. We all know this. 
If you've been around long enough, we know it. And when you come to Christ, as a matter of fact, your cakewalk sometimes uh, goes even further from a cakewalk. Why? Because no longer are you just free to do what you want. You see, the enemy is not concerned with people that are already lost and who are going to hell. He's not concerned about them. He just wants to destroy them. Guess what? When you become a believer in Christ, there's a target that's painted on you, and he wants to keep you from being effective and productive in your knowledge of Christ. He wants to cripple the church so that church is not effective, and he tries that for all he's worth. And Paul wanted the Thessalonians to know that he was not unaware of the schemes of the devil. But he also wanted them to understand that their suffering was under God's control. And this is mingled with this feeling of worry. Have you ever done something in the kingdom of God and then after you've done it, you're wondering, is this going to do anything for the good? Is God going to work through this? And I can tell you this much as a pastor, sometimes I lay awake at night looking at my ceiling, praying and wondering. And yes, sometimes fear creeps into me. Is the things that God is doing going to be shuffled and, and, and tampered with because the enemy, the tempter, is going to come along and he's going to, he's going to take a jab at those people? Huh. In, my, in my flesh, I get worried. I get anxious. And Paul, in his own words, he says, don't be anxious about anything, right? But here he is, laying awake, wondering. He was afraid in some way that the tempter might have tempted them and that their labors might have been in vain. This is a certain kind of affliction. It's a certain kind of temptation that if we're not careful, we can allow seep into us. You know, you know, sometimes when things are tough and we're in the midst of it all, we wonder, is God really in control of this? Does he really have this? Or maybe the devil got in there and did some work and caused us cause people to wander away from what it is that we are trying to accomplish. There is afflictions of many kinds, folks. Some Christians believe that we shouldn't suffer affliction and that God wants to teach us only by His Word, but not through trial or tribulation. But the reality is that suffering teaches us something. It teaches us perseverance, obedience, how to comfort others and brings us to deeper fellowship with God as we're faced with our own fears and we have to surrender them to the Lord. We cast ourselves upon Him for our strength when we're afflicted. And when we are weak, then we are strong because it's no longer I that lives, but it is Christ that lives in me. So I, I think this is kind of a, a snapshot of the heart of the apostle when he's wrestling with the same issue that we're talking about here. But God always has it under control. And he always uses the adversity that we face for our good. We might not see it at the time, but down the road we will see. God will do his work through us, and sometimes that means through suffering. In this passage, we're given insight into what we face as believers when it comes to advancing the faith. When you're out there, this is not neutral ground. When you decide that you're going to live for Jesus, when you yield to the call of the Lord to be his child, you enter a battle. In John, 1 John 5, 19, we're told, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So in a very real way here in, in chapter 3, verse 5, Paul was wondering if the enemy had caused enough mischief to topple the Thessalonians from their place. Maybe some of them weren't securely rooted. He was unsure of this. He was concerned that they'd succumb to Satan's attacks. And sometimes we see people 
that hear the gospel, they don't actually take root. It doesn't happen. So Paul, he's concerned about these people and, he, and he's looking at this in a certain way. You see, Satan does everything he can tempt, uh, to do, do to tempt individuals and larger groups of people to get them off of track of the track of God's mission for them. If you are a believer in Christ, your enemy out there does not want you to fulfill the mission of God for his glory. He does not want, and you're, you're in a battle. Sometimes we can get proud. We can allow pride to seep into our heart, and we can, we can think that somehow we're above the place of being deceived and moved by the enemy. You see, but if we're not careful, even Christians that have been Christians for many years, if we get out of sync with the Holy Spirit, we can find ourselves as a well-intentioned dragon. This is why it's so important that we pray. Because you cannot stand on your own strength. No matter how long you've been a believer, no matter how walk closely you walk with God, there will th- be circumstances in your life that will cause you to falter if your eyes get taken off of the Lord and onto the circumstances that you find yourself in. We must be aware that we're under... We're in the kingdom of God, but we're part of his army. And as part of his army, we are in a war for the souls of the people that are lost, that are out there, that are held in fortresses of captivity behind enemy lines. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, but the church must storm the gates of hell before the gates of hell will fall. And when you storm the gates of hell, there will be resistance. There will be an enemy that will try and block you. This is why the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and sober-minded. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Some have been falsely taught and there's a message going out there with some of these preachers that are preaching this message that there's no more battle because Christ has overcome Satan through the work on the cross. yes, That is true. It is true. The end game is that Jesus has won. The end game is that he has overcome Satan by his own blood and has crushed him, crushed the head of his power under his feet. But the truth is that God still grants Satan some authority in the world, which means that his power is not yet completely broken except in one area, and that is the power of death. It's an important passage because it shows Satan's place is very real in the spiritual realm. He's able to accuse God's people in his presence. We see this in Jude 1 9. We even see that Michael, the archangel, needs the help of the Lord in overcoming him. However, thankfully, Satan is restrained from enacting his full fury. He's still a created being and his power is limited. Well, God allows him to test us and to try us. Why? Because the testing of your faith will produce perseverance and what the enemy means for good, God can use it to bring strength. One day in the future, our adversary, the enemy, the devil and his angels, are going to be completely destroyed. They are going to be removed from the equation forever and ever and ever. They will be cast into the lake of fire. That is sure. That is the victory over the enemy. But God allows the enemy, the God of this world, to continue to work in this world until that day. I'm not saying, please don't get me wrong on this, I'm not saying that there is no victory over the devil and his works. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that sometimes we forget. 
we forget that we are still at war here. And we must watch our life and doctrine very closely or we can be deceived into causing other people to stumble and fall. Jesus has overcome. He has crushed the power of the devil. But if we lower our guard and try to fight Satan simply through human power on our own terms, we're going to face some deep disappointment. Because when I am proud, I will be humbled. My friends, this is the importance of the power of prayer. God does not want us just to rely on our own strength to overcome the wiles of the enemy. He wants us to call on his name and to ask him to fight on our behalf and to protect us. We must pray all kinds of prayers to pray that the enemy would be defeated as he tries to discourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Prayer is God's plan for us to come into harmony with him. When we pray according to the will of God, his hand is moved because he has chosen to work that way. God doesn't need you or me to do his work. He can do it all by himself, but he chooses to use you to participate with him in his good work. So when you pray, you are praying in sync with the spirit of the living God. And when you are in the sync, are in sync with the spirit of the living God, God's hand moves and miracles take place. The weapons we fight with in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 4 and 5 says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, we, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Even though Paul understood the dynamics of spiritual warfare in his own flesh, he feared somehow that the enemy had overcome the Thessalonians. And God, in his mercy, when we have those times of doubt, encourages us. If you come to that place where you've done God's will, and there's doubts that creep into your mind, and the enemy tries to plant fear so that it gets your eyes off of Jesus and onto the circumstances so that it, it keeps you anxious and awake and not able to to rest. God is merciful. He's merciful. And God put Paul's fears to rest. And you know how he did it? Paul sent Timothy. And the Thessalonians and Timothy, they got together and Timothy saw how the Thessalonians had taken root and how the word of God had done the work. You see, it wasn't just Paul's word that was doing the work. It isn't your work that does the work. You participate with God, but you are not the power behind the change in people's lives. It is the spirit of the living God that does the work of change in someone's life. You happen to walk in step with him and he gives you the privilege and the honor of walking with him, but you don't change anything. It is only the Lord that does the changing. And he brought back a report to Paul that in fact the faith of the Thessalonians was strong and that despite being persecuted and tried like they were, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead was working in them the same manner as it was working in Paul and his friends in Athens. It's natural for us to worry. It's natural for us to be anxious. As an example, you remember John the Baptist, the story of him, right? What did John see? John saw Jesus coming down to be baptized, 
And he was told by the Spirit of God, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he went to baptize Jesus. And the heavens opened and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. And the Father spoke and said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. John received a revelation of God through that experience. He had been heralding it, and then he saw it, and he saw the supernatural work of God, and yet we see he was taken by Herod, and he was thrown in a prison, and in his deepest, darkest sorrows, in his persecution, in his time of trial and trying, John, the greatest prophet ever, that ever was, doubted. There was an enemy incursion and an attack on him. And he was in prison. In Matthew eleven two four, 4, we read this. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? This is from the man who baptized Jesus and saw heavens open and heard the audible voice of God. So if someone like that is subject to getting his eyes off of Jesus, you and I are in no different position today. You see, this is why we need him. We need him. Every hour we need him. We can't do it on our own strength. We can't live the Christian life without his grace. There is no way we can do it. Why? Because our flesh is too strong. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. You see, God in his grace and his mercy looked at John in his suffering in that jail cell. And he realized that John needed encouragement. So what did he do? He used his people, his other people, to encourage him. This is why, folks, we're going to talk some about this this morning. This is why the church is called to be what it's called to be. You cannot make it out there as a lone ranger on your own. There's going to be times of darkness that you come by that you're going to be discouraged and you're going to get disoriented and you're going to get delusioned. And as a human being, sometimes you're going to take your eyes off of the Lord. And God in his mercy has called us together as a body of believers to stand together as an army so that we can stand together so that when one brother is falling, the other can lift him up. So when one brother is discouraged, another can pray for him and pray that God's blessing would be, be manifest in his life, that encouragement would come. We can encourage each other. We can lift one another up in prayer. God's called us to be a team together, the body of Christ, and each of you are part of that body, and it is so important for you to understand that this is not just a place you come to once a week just to get some kind of fill in your gas tank. This is a place that you come to 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 fellowship with a family of people that are to be around you, that you're to be there for, and they're there to be there for you. Why? Because God purposed that. God purposed for us to be together. And we're bound together by the Spirit. The Spirit calls us to be the body. You're living stones. Each of you build are built upon one another. You need each other. Why? Because God purposed it that way. You're a stone structure, a church that is built up, a place that is filled with the Spirit where God dwells. God lives in us both individually as living stones and corporately as a body of believers so that God is worshipped and glorified in our midst. So if you're trying to run the Christian race alone, out there on your own, you're running out of sync with God's plan for you. See, Paul says this. He says, God encouraged Paul through this. Paul was struggling. He was worrying about the faith of the, of the Thessalonians. And God used Timothy and the Thessalonian believers to encourage him. He says, but Timothy has now just come to us from you and has brought us good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all of our distress and persecution, we were encouraged by you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? 
Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Do you see the affection that Paul has for these brothers and sisters? And it is apparent that they have the same affection for him. The Lord of peace confirmed to Paul that the hardships he was facing were not for nothing. It's never for nothing. The seed that was planted in his ministry with them has grown because why? It is the word of God. It is not Paul's word that was planted. It is the word of God. And the word of God shall not return void. So when you serve the Lord and you take the word of God to the people that God has called you to take the word of God to, you can be sure that God's word will not return void. It will cause life to occur. Wherever the word of God is preached in power under the anointing of the spirit, there is life. There is fullness of joy. And what does joy stand for? When we are looking at ourselves and our self-interest and our lives and our trials and our troubles and our tribulation and all we're thinking about is ourselves, there is misery, there is discouragement, there is depression. But when you have the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord stands for this. Jesus first, when I put Jesus first, and then I take others and I put them second, and myself third. When I do that, when I put Jesus first, others second, and myself below that, then there is joy. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy brought Paul to an earnest prayer of thanksgiving. He wanted to be reunited with them. He, he couldn't wait to be around the children of God. Sometimes, I think, in modern church, we look at this so compartmentalized. We look at it as, I, I come to church. No, you don't come to church. Friends, you are the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You are the church. You are as important as the person next to you. You are as important as the pastor. You are important, as important as the music leader or the board member or the deacon or whatever. You are the church and each of you is a part of it. Each of you has an equal part to play in this. We all need one another and we need to work together. The church that works together is the one that will shine brightly for the glory of God. Amen. If God has called us to minister to others, God has called us to love one another. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 expresses the magnitude of affection that God or that Paul had for his brothers and sisters. Now, this is the church in Thessalonica that we're preaching about here this morning. But in Corinth, God said this, or through Paul, Paul, Paul says this, and God spoke through him because he wants us to do the same. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Or Paul addresses the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 5, 1 and 2, and he says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And what? Walk in the way of professionalism. Walk in the way of keeping myself looking good in front of the people in the church when I come on Sunday morning and I sit in the pew? No, 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 no. He says, follow my example and walk in the way of love. Love. Pastor, you preach so much about love. Yes. Love is the core, the root of everything. It has to be. Beloved, Follow the Lord's example. Follow God's example, dear, for as dearly, therefore as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. When we face hardships, man, I'm no different than you guys. I come into the church sometimes, into the, into the meeting place, and I've had a rough week, man. I've been banged around. And sometimes I just feel like Sitting there and going, I just need everyone to stay away and I just, need, I just need some space and I need some... I feel that way. I'm a human being. You are too. Sometimes you come here this morning, you don't feel like coming here this morning. You come here this morning and you're feeling you've been beat up. You feel like, I can't, I don't know if I can 
face people this morning. You see, in our flesh, life is tough. Trials will come. They will come. There's no cakewalk out there. And I can have a reaction to troubles in my flesh. Trouble reactions like fear. You see, when I cluster myself into a shell, it's really me saying I'm afraid of being hurt. (laughs) I don't like to be hurt. You don't like to be hurt either. We don't like to be hurt. So when we come together, sometimes we come together with these walls around our hearts. And if I cling to self, and if I try to save myself, I'll find myself losing. But when I open my heart and I say, God, take my life as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice of praise unto you, and I will love as you have loved, Lord, if you give me the strength to do it, because I can't do it on my own. And I open myself up to the other people that are sitting around me. Then I will follow God's example as his dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, as Paul says to the Ephesians. So what does this mean about church and about church life? It means that when we come to church and do church life, it's not just about the activity that I'm here for. I'm not paying some sort of homage just to pay for, to to show my allegiance to God by coming here. I'm not saying it's wrong to have that feeling, but that can't be the driving force. The driving force behind this is to glorify God. And how is God glorified? When I love him and open my heart up, heart up to love the other person that's sitting next to me. Love is the way. Love is the way. (laughs) In our Bible study, we got excited. (laughs) At least I did. I don't know about you guys that were there. I got excited. I got excited because we talked, we're studying Philippians, and we talked about Philippians too. And Paul says this in Philippians 2, 1 to 5, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, are you encouraged this morning for being united to Christ, for having your sins forgiven, for being washed clean, and, and, and your sins cast as far as east is from the west? I trust you are. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, Have you had any comfort from the love that he's poured out on you, that he's lavished upon you, despite the fact that you didn't deserve it? His grace has been given to you freely as a gift. Why? Because he loved you before you loved him. Any tenderness, if any common sharing in the Spirit, has the Holy Spirit given you life? Do you feel the presence of of the Spirit at work inside of you? Oh, yes, you do. If you're a child of God, you do. If any tenderness and compassion, are you glad that when you mess things up so badly, you go, I don't know how God could even care about me. I'm such a colossal disaster. I know what I ought to do, and there I go and do the wrong thing again. Oh, God, have mercy. And you know what? The Spirit comes alongside you and goes, I love you. I forgive you. Come here, my child. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Any tenderness and compassion? Have you received tenderness and compassion when you didn't deserve it from the Lord? I have. I'm a chief among sinners in my life, and so are you. And we need his compassion and prayerfully those things are left behind because as we love God, we obey him. As we come to love him and understand his love for us, we turn our, our backs on the things that are useless. If all these things are true, Paul says, then make my joy complete. Remember, Jesus, others, myself, by being like-minded, having the same love, being One in spirit and one of mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Did you catch that? When I am part of the church, I'm not to look to my own interests. I am to look to the interests of the people sitting around me, to the interests of others. What does Jesus want to do in the life of the person that's next to you? What does he want to do in, in this body of believers? What ways can I be someone who can be used by Jesus to minister to that other person? And this is why our brother Paul prays for the Thessalonians in our text. In verse 12, he says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as our love does for you, just as ours does for you. You see, God wants us to love the people in our immediate circle, but he doesn't want it to stop there. I love my wife, but he doesn't want it to stop there. I love my kids, but he doesn't want it to stop there. I love my church and, and, my, and, my, and my little group that I have for Bible study, but he, doesn't want to, he wants me to love the church in general, and it does, but it doesn't stop there. He wants me to love the, the, the church of the people that, that are going to other fellowships, but it doesn't stop there. He wants me to love those who are lost and who are dying and who need the message of the cross to set them free from the bondage of sin and of death. He wants me to love. That's why the scripture says that God is love and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. That's why that scripture is there. My friends, Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Your enemy is out there, but guess who's overcome your enemy by the power of the blood? Jesus has overcome. And you too can be overcomers as well as you yield to the Lord. So when you fight your battles, put on the full armor of God, having done everything to stand, that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand strong. Consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. The weapons of our warfare, friends, are not the weapons of this world. They demolish strongholds. Do you see strongholds out there in the society that people are bound by? Chains of darkness that they can't set themselves free from? They're everywhere. Jesus Christ came to save, to deliver, and to heal, and to bring to bring sight to the blind, to bring health to those who are crippled spiritually. He came to save, deliver, and heal. And he came that you might have life and that you might have his life abundantly as you live for him. So, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, folks, we are family. Family needs to be together. Needs to stay together. Needs to work together. Needs to come out of those shells of protection where we're afraid. Perfect love casts out all fear. And that's why the scripture is so full of it. And Jesus says, when your enemy is hungry, feed him. When he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Why? You're exposing yourself by love. You're exposing yourself to being hit. And guess what? You will be. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you will have overcome by the word of God. You have overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of your testimony. There's going to be a great deal of believers before the throne of God and one day we're going to see it all who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Are you an overcomer today? Not in yourself you're not, but in Jesus Christ you are. You're a child of God. The Spirit of Christ dwells within you, so live as such. Live the life. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We don't just come to church. We are the church. Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians and my prayer for you is that where we lack, you see, the Thessalonians were loving. 
We're loving too. There's many, I have been blessed so much by people that are loving one another here. I, I just see it all over the place. Every, everywhere I look in this congregation, I see people loving on each other. That's great. But you know what? We're not done yet. I pray that our love for Christ might abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That your love for one another would increase. Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians is that they, where they lack, that the Lord would bring more increase. May we increase in our understanding on how we ought to love one another, how we ought to do that practically, how we ought to shine brightly in this dark world as we see the day of Christ approaching. The day of the Lord is coming. It's coming. We're in the last days. We're going to be talking about that some more. But guess what? Paul finishes off his chapter in Thessalonians, and may this also be our prayer. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all of his holy ones. If you want to be an overcomer, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and you will be on the right track. We can't do that, but God provides us with the Spirit who enables us to love where we can't in our own self. Amen? May he strengthen our hearts so that we will be blameless. Love always leads to holiness. Love isn't just overlooking, oh yeah, I love... You know, but your love and my love may be different things. No. Love always leads to obedience to the word of God. Always, always, always. We want to be a church that's glorifying to God, that shines brightly on this hillside. <laughs> love is the way. May he strengthen you. This morning, we come to the communion table. And... Um, I'm just going to ask um, those who have been uh, asked to participate with communion this morning to come forward. And as they come forward, we're just going to pray to ready our hearts. The Bible says that we ought to examine our hearts when we come to this table. And if there's anything that we're holding on to that isn't right, we need to make that right. This is a time where we consider the broken body and blood of Christ and the forgiveness that he's given us through that. We do this in remembrance of him. Why? Because he first loved us. He loved us and gave himself as a fragrant offering for us and we're so thankful for that. And what does he ask us to do? He asks us to submit to him and to forgive others as he, in fact, has done the work and has forgiven us. So if there's anything in our hearts that is encumbering us this morning, that's keeping us distant from God, you can be a believer, but be, be distant from God because you're not living right. God wants you to surrender those things this morning. Surrender it. Lay it down. If anyone, it's not his will that we sin, but if anyone does sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. And God wants you this morning to be close to him. He doesn't just want you to walk at arm's length. He wants to draw you in. And he wants you to open your arms and embrace him for all that he is. This morning, is there anything that's tying you up? Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been abused. Maybe you've been crippled by a blow. Maybe you were in a dungeon of sorts like John the Baptist was, and you're looking and you're going, is he really the Messiah? I know that I've seen him work in my life, but is he really him? Maybe that's you this morning. I want you to know that he is. He is alive, and he holds all power in his hands. So don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Don't allow the enemy any kind of a foothold in your life. Surrender him, the throne of every portion of your spirit and soul. Your spirit is his, but sometimes in our soul life, that's where we sin. We allow the enemy to, to have a, a say, and we listen to that lie. See, Jesus wants you to be free in him. And when we come to the communion table, it's important that we let him take everything. And that there's no... There's no distance between us and God in communion. See, you're his child, 
but he wants you to be close to him. So let go of everything. We, we do communion this morning in honor of Jesus, recognizing his broken body and his blood that was shed for us. The Bible says that when we gather together, we're supposed to examine our hearts. And the reason why we're supposed to examine our hearts, friends, is because our hearts are prone to wander. And sometimes we just need to get realigned with what's right. Is there something that you're struggling with? All of us struggle with something. Go ahead, gentlemen. All of us struggle sometimes. But God is good. He's faithful and He's just. He sees the deepest part of your heart. And He has come that you might have life, that you might have life abundantly. We're just going to bow in silence before the Lord now and just reflect. If there's anything that you've allowed just to get in the way, just give that to Him now. From the book of 1 Corinthians, concerning the Lord's Supper, reading from verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, he said to the Corinthians. For some of your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for others. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. In that passage of Scripture, the Corinthians had trouble. They didn't understand the importance of communion and what communion was all about. This morning we have children with us that are believers, that have come to know Jesus. It's important for us kids and everyone, before you take communion, you understand what it's all about. This is not to fill your tummy with some crackers or to have a drink of juice. This is a deeper thing. See, the Corinthians were taking communion in an unworthy manner. Many of them were, because they weren't recognizing what it's all about. Communion is, rec is representing us being brought close to God, to be being made at one with Him. Why? You were brought to be one with God through Jesus. When Jesus was beaten, when he willingly stretched out his hands and the nails were driven through his wrists and his feet and the crown of thorns was driven around his head and the blood ran down. That blood was for you and for me. See, without that sacrifice, we're lost. And when we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, be my savior, we're asking him to pay the penalty of our sin. You see, Jesus was God's Passover lamb. In Egypt, on the night of the Passover, those who had the blood of the lamb that was applied to the doorposts of their house leading into their house were spared death. And Jesus is the Passover lamb so that in you, you like a house, 
And when Jesus' blood is applied to the doorpost of your house, and this is a metaphor, the, the blood of Jesus represents God's gift of love to you and his life that comes when you receive it as a gift. His blood pays the penalty of death for sin in your life. So when you drink the cup and when you take the bread, you're doing this in memory of Jesus who didn't have to. He's the king of the universe. He was beaten and bruised for our transgressions, for our sins. The penalty of sin was poured out in fullness. The wrath of God was pulled, poured out on Jesus so that the wrath of God didn't have to be poured out on you. Isn't that good news? When we eat and when we drink of communion, we do it in a manner that God prescribes in memory of all that Jesus has done on our behalf. Jesus died instead of you to give you life spiritually forever and ever. And by his stripes, you have been healed as a believer in Christ. You are healed Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. This is God's gift to you through his grace. And that's why we take this. So this day, we take this bread, Lord, and we remember Jesus, the stripes that were laid across your back. God, they mocked you, and they beat you. And you did it, looking all the way through history, to us here today. And because of your great love, God, you went to Calvary, you went to the cross for us. You could have called legions of angels to intervene and stop the process, but you didn't because you loved us so much. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking the beating instead of us. So now, Lord, in memory of you, we partake of this bread. In Jesus' name, let's partake. And this cup, this cup is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus. Whenever we drink from this cup together as his, as his church, and each part of one of you who is a believer is a part of that. We remember the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and what that means. You have life, eternal life, and life starting here and now because of what Jesus has done. Friends, he cleansed us of our sins, but he didn't leave us vacant. He cleansed us of our sins so that the Spirit of God could move inside of us. So that now, the temple is no longer out there somewhere. The temple of God is in the hearts of his children. And that's as close as you can ever be to God, is to have him within you. What a gift of life. That is not possible without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, the pure, spotless Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And that's why John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Jesus, we thank you for the blood that you shed on Calvary for us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing those soldiers to pound those spikes through your hands or through your wrists and through your feet, Lord, and that crown of thorns. And as the blood ran down, Lord, Although you created the world and everything in it, you looked down upon those who were beating you and abusing you with compassion in your eyes, and you spoke these words that will ever for, forever be written and remembered by us, Lord. You said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for the blood of the Lamb. And we partake right now in Jesus' name in remembrance of you, O oh Lord. Let us partake together. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Would you all stand with us this, this morning as we close the service off? We're just going to close in song together. May God's grace and peace rest on you in fullness and abundance. May his face shine on you as you go throughout your week. May you go forward in his name, victorious. Amen. God bless you.